Just a reminder that if you um, are are not a speaker, please keep yourself muted. Um, we will have time um, and you can always pop questions into the um, chat box as we go along for any of our speakers. And um, my colleague, uh, Maggie Barker, will be on to um, put information about each of the organizations that are participating today in the chat box so you can learn a little bit more about them and be able to, um, you know, just, uh, hear what they have to say and, and, and go check out resources if you are located in the country in which they are operating. Um, so I'd love to kick us off um, by starting um, with uh, one of our partners who um, has done a lot of work in the international space, uh, Dr. Tabassum Burroughs, who is an obstetric internist who specializes in women's heart health after preeclampsia. And she helps to serve patients who may not have access to care. Um, Dr. Feroz, could you talk a little bit about some of the challenges that you've experienced um, by women who can't easily access care, like those in rural and remote settings or those who face other types of structural barriers? Hi, Lainey, thank you so much. And hello to everybody. Thank you so much for having me. I think this is a really important question as it's relevant uh, in both high income settings as it is in resource challenge settings. Uh, women, for example, in rural and remote areas face what we call place-based disparities. These could be things like you mentioned, um, Lainey, like having uh, difficulty accessing care. For example, in many rural and remote communities, these are maternity care deserts where there is a lack of providers or medical facilities. And we all know globally that the COVID-19 pandemic has caused significant service disruptions, making access to care even more difficult in these places. Um, other things that you know we all know that are still very impactful and affect women are things like geography, seasonality, like snow or rain, transportation, um, finances, and these are just some <clears throat> of those things that limit women from accessing care. One of the things that we don't often think about for women in rural and remote areas that is now emerging in the literature is that we find that in rural settings, women are disproportionately affected by modifiable cardiovascular risk factors like chronic hypertension. And we know that it's a risk factor for preeclampsia. So these women um, already are marginalized and are entering into pregnancy with a higher risk for preeclampsia. And on top of it, there's other layers of disparities. For example, um, using the US, um, often women who live in rural and remote areas also face racial disparities in the very same communities. So with that in mind, you know, we also know that a significant proportion of maternal morbidity and mortality, um, secondary to preeclampsia and the hypertensive disorders occur in the postpartum period. So it makes that postpartum follow-up and care so, so critical, but we know that the women in rural and remote areas and women facing other barriers are most marginalized and vulnerable. And one specific thing that I want to highlight is that women who are affected by preeclampsia are at risk of early heart disease. And often after doing their OB care with their maternity provider, the care tends to stop after six weeks in many, many countries. But these women need much longer term follow up, which of course is much more challenging in rural and remote areas. So women are often left without follow up and now very well may have a chronic disease like high blood pressure. And this not only has implications for a future pregnancy, but also implications for her long-term health. So especially in these um, areas where women are facing disparities and structural barriers, we need community-based and innovative solutions so that we can deliver care that is culturally acceptable to women, easily accessible and affordable, and these could be things like expanding the workforce, you know, in areas where there are midwives and doulas training them in this kind of postpartum care and definitely strengthening primary care services. And that is 
a, a global challenge. Doesn't matter where you're at. Expanding telehealth services, the use of mobile vans, you know, things that are simple to deliver, like measuring blood pressure, monitoring certain blood work after six months, and definitely providing good care between pregnancies so women are optimized from a heart health perspective. That is the perfect overview to start our discussion because I think one of the things that you find when you speak with women from all over the world is that the challenges that are faced in countries like the US or the UK are, um, well, different from those that might be happening in low and middle income countries. At the end of the day, there's the, still the same challenges that exist um, no matter where you are with this particular condition. So that's such a great overview. Um, so um, the next um, group that I'd like to, to just um, hear from is uh, Leah Baker from Preeclampsia Foundation Canada, and um, she is going to share a little bit about her story and how she got involved as a patient advocate uh, doing this work with a patient advocacy organization like the Preeclampsia Foundation Canada. Yeah, thank you very much, Lainey. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, a little bit about my background. I am a survivor of HELP syndrome, so a, a severe variant of um, preeclampsia. Uh, back in 2010, I developed it while delivering my firstborn son, and a lot of my signs and symptoms were missed and were not taken seriously by my own healthcare provider, um, which led me to which led me to, um, after, after my experience and after coming out of that, I was desperate to find um, com community and find like what happened to me and understand and, and look for others that had similar experiences, which led me to um, Preeclampsia Foundation in the US mm -hmm. and then getting connected with other women through the communities that they built on Facebook. And at that time, it was still like a forum on online. So I got involved with that and started understanding exactly what happened to me and realizing that nobody around me had anything similar. And so I thought, how, how can I get involved? What can I do? And um, how can I make a difference for women? And I just, I, I really wanted to educate others and especially not just women, but their families as well. Cause I realized this, you know, not just women, but their their families need to understand this. Um, it was actually my husband who was my biggest advocate. I wasn't even my own advocate. It was him. So um, educating the families is so important as well. So that led me to, like I was saying, the Preeclampsia Foundation in the U.S. And then realizing we didn't have anything like this in Canada. So um, a group of us got together. Um, actually, Eleni from the U.S. came up to Canada, and there was a bunch of us that got together and started to form um, a sister organization in Canada. So that happened back in uh, 2015. We became a registered charity, and we've been on a mission to raise awareness and education for women and their families and uh, raise funds for uh, for research, because that's another <laughs> important element that, um, yeah, we just, in order to advance the research, um, we're raising funds for that. So yes, um, I got involved. Um, I wanted to participate in a, in a promise walk for preeclampsia. So that was happening in the U.S. and I wanted to bring that to Canada. And we had our first one back in 2017. And since we have had many walks in many locations, um, so that was really exciting for us to to bring that awareness and bring that community together here in Canada. Yeah, and I think you highlight something that's so um, unique to the preeclampsia community, which is that really need to come together with people who have been in the same experiences. And that's something that patient advocacy organizations like those on the call are very uniquely positioned to do because we have a connection to other groups. And as you said, um, what started as sort of an online community has now grown into an opportunity for people to get together in Canada um, in person as well as online and, and just take their experiences and help others with it. So I appreciate that perspective that you bring, Leah. Thank you. Um, 
uh, you know, all that you've really said highlights those common things that we hear from preeclampsia patient stories. So I wanted to um, next uh, ask Lynn Roberts from Australian APEC Action on Preeclampsia to just tell us a little bit about what you see um, happening with patient communities in Australia. And um, she's there at about 10 p.m. So um, it's evening where she is. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Lainey. Yes, well, preeclampsia day is drawing to a close here in Sydney, Australia. Um, thank you so much for having me on the forum today uh, to talk about preeclampsia in Australia. Um, I could probably tell a, a similar story to what the previous two presenters have talked about um, in that um, I joined preeclampsia after uh, APEC after in experiencing preeclampsia myself and now I am the president of it 30 years later I've taken that big plunge um, so what we're seeing in Australia is um, we do have a lot of regional and remote areas which struggle with good medical care just like you do in a lot of other countries um, where I'm based in Sydney it's um, very well developed so I'd probably be talking a bit more about that this evening if that's okay um, so um, what we are seeing with the women who are experiencing preeclampsia is um, a mental health concern um, after the event. Um, we've studied women six months, two years and five years after their preeclampsia experience. And we've certainly reported an increase in depression, signs of depression at six months postpartum. Um, and a lot of women are reporting their births as a traumatic event. So I think um, one of the big uh, aims of Australian APEC is to support women and their families after having preeclampsia or during their pregnancy. Um, and we, we are struggling with this part of um, with this aim in APEC in that we're only a small charity. We don't have the resources to offer a, um, a very good round the clock counseling service. How we're managing it is women will contact us through our website or our social media pages, and we will get back to them. And sometimes we've organized a little one-on-one -on -one phone call with someone on the APEC committee. We do have a medical advisor who's an obstetrician. We have a midwifery advisor. We also have a social worker on our committee. So we can offer a little bit of support and counseling that way. Um, but that's something that is really lacking even in our big city that we don't have resources for um, the initial counselling. So the women rely on the information on our website for their main support. Um, one of the other things I really do notice is the lack of knowledge about preeclampsia in the pregnant community. And many women are coming into hospital to have their babies. They've never even heard the word preeclampsia, let alone know what it is. Um, so again, one of our aims is to be informing women um, about what it is. So we do try to get out there doing um, presentations. We have recently done a webinar where we ran a question and answer, answer session. The feedback from that webinar was fantastic with the suggestion of running a similar webinar with a research focus. So in July, we are just starting to plan to have a research webinar and I have a few contacts around the country. So we'll get some really key people to come and present at that webinar and hopefully that'll just help inform the women a bit more. Um, and tying in with that is raising awareness in the community um, about preeclampsia. And what better day to do that than World oh. Preeclampsia Day, which um, as we were discussing before, falls on a Monday. So yesterday we had um, some walks organized. We, we did have a campaign this year to have walks happening all around <laughs> Australia. We managed to have um, four organized walks in four different cities, which are in four different states. And there's still people walking around their local neighborhood in what we call the virtual walk. Um, so we all went dressed up in our APEC t-shirts and bandanas and we had drink bottles and tote bags and we had our banners up. So um, we were speaking to people who just passed by. So we are trying to raise awareness out there about preeclampsia and, and what we can do for it. I, mean, I think one of the, the, the best things we can do to help women is 
to be involved in research and we certainly do try to support and promote research. Um, we are currently um, APEC, Australian APEC is currently um, supporting a, two quite large uh, funding applications here in Australia as a consumer, a con, uh, you know, a consumer organisation. We also have, um, we have a master's project to uh, a master's student who's a, approached us and we're supporting her project. We will be advertising her research on all our social media platforms very soon now that World Preeclampsia Day is over. Um, and that will be for recruitment purposes. So we're more than happy to help people with their research. Um, and I've recently started thinking about setting up some sort of way to offer a small grant opportunity for an early researcher, maybe just a small amount of money to help them with their project or to help them get to a conference to present their work to, to spread the word of their research. So this is what we're seeing in Australia and how Apex trying to help. Um, I feel we've done really good work over the last uh, six months or so since we've had our new committee in. We have a long way to go, um, but it's just small steps that make big progress. So um, hopefully that will continue for us. Thank you. That is so true, Lynn. And I'm so glad that you brought up the component of maternal mental health, because mm. that is one area that across the world, we are just mm. doing a real disservice to women in the postpartum period, especially preeclampsia survivors and their families that have been through these traumatic experiences. And I would love to see us be able to, to offer more and to really connect these women to um, resources to help them through that process. Mm. Um, that's a great segue to our next speaker, because it's really heartbreaking that any woman and her family should have to face such a frightening experience and often an unexpected experience. Um, I have Ashley Mutiti from the uh, uh, Zuri Nuzlana Foundation from Kenya. And I asked her to come and talk a little bit about her experience as a preeclampsia survivor in Kenya and some of the challenges that she sees for the preeclampsia community in her country. Hi everyone, um, it's truly a pleasure to be here and um, listen to the impact that we are all making in creating awareness and basically leaving a mark to ensure that women are not going to die as a result of um, this disorder. My name is Ashley Muteti. I am from Kenya. I am a mom of three. Um, I run and I founded Zurin Zilani Foundation uh, here in Kenya after my own personal experience, having experienced preeclampsia three times, one in which I unfortunately lost my firstborn daughter. And when I was in hospital, admitted with Zuri uh, when she was in Niku, and we usually went to, we were going to um, this breastfeeding station seven out of the 10 women who had children in Niku were admitted because um, they suffered from preeclampsia and therefore they had premature babies. And all of us did not know what was happening to us. And so I saw there's such a huge gap in information. People are not aware about um, uh, preeclampsia and how it manifests itself. And so I, started during the Lani, uh, Foundation as a patient adv advocacy group to advocate for better maternal and newborn uh, health care for women and their children. And we have different programs at Zurin Zilani Foundation with our core interest in strengthening education during antenatal clinics and also strengthening the education for healthcare providers. We have a digital platform which is one of our resource center and one of the best thing I think that has happened to us as a foundation because we have seen such positive reviews in how much information is power and how much women are able to take charge of their own health when they're informed more about what's happening in their bodies. And so for us, we are really keen on education, educating the mother, empowering her with information so that she can be able to detect 
uh, any symptom and know what uh, are the steps that she needs to seek um, help when she's suffering from uh, preeclampsia. So in um, building and strengthening education with healthcare providers, we do this through our conferences that uh, we have. I'm happy to see Maggie, uh, Dr. Maggie here. Um, she's been part of uh, the conferences that we do. Uh, we've done one with Ghana and I'm happy Koyo is also here. Um, so what we are trying to do is really to raise our voices by, like in Kenya, I will tell you, we have like 500 gynecologists against a population of 54 million people. So the people who are generally in the primary care health facilities are nurses, midwives, um, and clinicians. And so we are targeting nurses, midwives, and clinicians by offering them um, with information on new technologies, new innovations that they can be able to detect early and treat women who are coming in with severe preeclampsia. And actually to avoid that severe severity, severe effects to the mother. So we do that um, through education and that's through one of um, our conferences that we do. I'm very, very happy to be here and I'm looking forward for us to take the information further and to help women because we see the challenges, we know the challenges that are there and uh, we hope that one day we'll be able to get a complete cure so that women won't be able to um, die and lose their children because of this disease. I'm so happy to be here and thank you all. Yeah, thank you so much, Ashley, not just for being here, but for all that you do. And um, I have to say, you know, I've been in this space a long time and I've just seen such a transformation in people's awareness globally of preeclampsia. And it's thanks to all of the patient advocacy organizations that are on this call, you know, um, hopefully we do get one day to a place where um, we're not losing babies and we're not, um, you know, we actually have some better treatments and ways to cure preeclampsia. Um, so um, the group Action on Preeclampsia in the UK and their partnership with Action on Preeclampsia International has really worked to take some of the things that we have found in the research that can be done um, to help decrease maternal and infant death and as Ashley was talking about, you know, innovations using um, mobile technology and different things. And I'm so grateful to have um, Sister Betty here from Sierra Leone, who is a midwife and community health worker, who's <clears> making <throat> a real difference for women who have been affected by preeclampsia um, in partnership with APEC International. So um, Sister Betty, could you just tell us a little bit, what do you see as kind of the main hope that we have in addressing preeclampsia? Thank you very much, Len. Um, I'm having problems with connection, so I will not put my turn on my video. So thank you for inviting us. I really think that the cradle device, I will go straight to the cradle device that is given, you know, being used in Sierra Leone here, in all facilities that have been trained, including training of healthcare workers to build their capacity in the use of the cradle device. Cradle device has been automated for uh, detecting uh, raised blood pressure, which is a sign of um, preeclampsia. So a lot of capacity building is going on in all 16 districts in the country. And to date, more than 2000 healthcare workers have been trained to provide care. And the care we have training for them to be able to promptly, timeliness and um, adequately de detecting the, the preeclampsia signs and dealing with it. Because in Sierra Leone, there's a lot of um, mis misconception about preeclampsia. There is this belief that it is um, people are, they were pregnant women are being possessed by demons. So, that's why they get why especially they get when, they get the eclampsia, when they get the eclampsia. So we are using innovations like using the cradle device, doing a lot of research to really discover what can be done. And um, in the last few months, we have heard that um, there has been a drastic reduction in maternal death. And um, 
I think, although a research has not been done to really bring the facts, but I think in my experience that the cradle, the use of the cradle device and the training that is going on has contributed to that reduction in Sierra Leone. So in this, um, um, on this world uh, in preeclampsia day, there is a lot of awareness raising with communities using um, stickers on public transports, flying the routes, also engaging with radio and television discussions to be able to raise awareness among the community and even the, the pregnant women so that they know exactly what preeclampsia is and how they can uptake service early to detect the condition. Yeah, I think that highlights so much like how um, there's a few really important things when it looks at when we look at preeclampsia care and it's <clears throat> making sure that women are educated on signs and symptoms, making sure that we're monitoring mm -hmm. their blood pressure and making sure we get them to care when they experience high blood pressure. You know, um, it's funny because it, it feels so simple and yet the, the, imp the actual implementation of that can be incredibly complex. So we're so grateful to you for all the work that you're doing to help members of our preeclampsia community. Um, so now I'd like to um, ask uh, Marcus from Action on Preeclampsia in the UK um, to just chat and tell us a little bit about how do we keep partner voices involved in this process of improving care and improving outcomes for women and their families? Thank you, Lainey, and it's an absolute pleasure to be here with so many friends from throughout the world today uh, on another wonderful uh, World Preeclampsia Day. So thank you for all the work that the foundations have done that you and Elaine have uh, put into it uh, and the work of ISSHP uh, and all the other organisations which we're so proud to be associated with. Uh, today, um, we've, uh, we've, we've taken a slightly different view. Uh, and over the last 12 months, we've seen more and more calls on our helpline uh, that aren't coming from women themselves, but are coming from their partners. And um, we've had more and more conversations with partners who are saying, look, she's saying she's all right. She's saying everything seems to be fine, but I'm really worried. I'm seeing the, the signs and symptoms. Should we be worried? And we've been trying to get that voice out there because it's another voice, that voice of the family, uh, identifying preeclampsia as a uh, condition is so important. The earlier we are recognizing it, the more that we can do and the more care can, can be given. So uh, on Thursday, I got together with a group of, of guys uh, and all of us are preeclampsia dads. Uh, we we um, did a, a, a YouTube uh, a broadcast, which is available on our YouTube channel. And after I've finished waffling, I will put it up uh, in, in the chat. And I'd heartily encourage you to, to have a look at it, because what we found was lots and lots of common issues. Um, recognizing symptoms, those symptoms not being uh, recognized by other people, uh, feeling that... Um, uh, it was it, it was something that they uh, that they were wrong about or weren't being listened to. Uh, so so we had a good chat and, and talked through some of these issues uh, and some of the the wider concerns that, that the guys had got. Uh, and we, we had a, a fantastic conversation. And I'd recommend it for viewing to any healthcare professional. The other thing that's happened is one of our uh, uh, partners, a guy called Paul, has written a book which um, is called. Help, I'm going to be a dad, uh, playing on the help syndrome. His um, partner had help syndrome. He's written a book about it from a men's perspective, and it's absolutely fantastic. It's launched today. Uh, it's available now on Amazon, and I'll put a link up to that as well. So I think that there's a, a role here. We know women uh, sometimes don't hear about preeclampsia. We know partners sometimes don't, <coughs> don't hear. But when we can get both together and both hearing about preeclampsia, and advocating for one another, we we will start to conquer this and we will start to make a difference. So that's what I, I wanted to say today, Lainey, but once again, thank you very much for hosting today. Yeah, and thank you for being here, Marcus, and also representing the, the, the dad voice, the partner voice, because I think um, just like anything, it takes um, not just patients raising their voice, but also the people who love them, the people who are around them, the people who may witness moments in their story that the patient herself um, is not necessarily aware of because of the help situation that she's experiencing. And so it takes us all to um, kind of shift and make a difference um, in this space. And we're seeing progress, which is wonderful. 
Um, so that segment weighs me very nicely into asking Dr. Laura McGee, who is the um, immediate past president of the International Society for the Study of Hypertension in Pregnancy, to um, to provide just a few remarks um, and tell us a little bit about the work that ISSHP does. Um, and, uh, and specifically how you have historically partnered with patient advocacy organizations like all of those on the call. Well, thank, thank you very much, Lainey, and um, delighted to be here and um, grateful for the, uh, the invitation, it's an honor. So ISSHP goes back many years, back to 1978. And so for the last 45 years, we've been uh, meeting as an organization and have had a sense of community in research. And for many, many of those years, the Preeclampsia Foundation um, uh, has joined us in those meetings and it's been extremely um, important. And one of our, um, because, because the, the, the patient voice is integral to everything that we do, we, we have as a standard, um, uh, as part of our standard meeting template now uh, for, for our international meetings, a meeting of patient organizations, because we hope to promote that sense of international community from the patient perspective as well, from the family perspective, because uh, you know, we learn a lot from how things are done in other countries and, and, um, and, and uh, where we, we, uh, we assume that um, that the same will be true for, for the organizations. And I, um, I try to promote that through our guidelines, through co-authorship, and we're just, you know, we're here to listen. And so I just wanted to echo some of the things that I've heard so far that I think are extremely important from our perspective, and certainly that's empowerment. The last time I checked, the woman is the only person who is present at all times. Uh, with regards to the um, the, the 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 detection um, and um, and management, optimal management of, of preeclampsia for mother and baby, so it is critically important from our point of view um, that she be fully aware of why someone is measuring her blood pressure every time she is seen and what the implications are if it's above at or above a certain. Um, certain number. Um, the importance of partners, the COVID taught us nothing else. It's the fact that women need their, 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 their partners. They, we, 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 we need that sense of community uh, during the pregnancy as well to advocate, support, be another pair of ears listening to information. Um, research, supporting research, it's critically important that we have patient partners in the, in the, in the planning uh, and the the execution of the research, and then the dissemination of the um, the messaging, and um, being a Leah, being a, a Canadian, I you know I I I remember with great fondness on the front of Sick Kids in Toronto, they had a banner up for a while, and it was very simple, and it said, "Research makes sick kids better." Period. And I I thought that's a beautiful message because that is what happens. Is it just it just optimizes um, care for mothers and babies. Um, so it's wonderful to hear about all the work um, going on. And I just wanted to say it's an honor for ISSHP to be invited to the panel. And uh, we look forward to, uh, to, to, seeing, to seeing as many of you as possible in person or online at our um, next international con con Congress. And I believe that you ha have a panel member who will speak to that, so I won't. I won't steal the thunder. Thank yes, you. and that was a perfect segue because I was going to ask Dr. Ravafi Rajan, who is actually um, from the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine India and is also one of the organizers of the ISSHP World Congress this year, which is in Bengaluru, uh, India, to, um, to tell us a little bit about um, what has been happening at the ISSHP World Congress and how we kind of connect researchers and providers in this space with the, the patient advocacy. Um, there's a lot going on in India um, with regards to patient care and um, bringing the patient voice more into that. So Dr. Rajan, would you um, like to make a few comments? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Lenny, and I'm so glad that I heard so many voices 
you know, from across the world. And it's really inspiring. And thank you so much, Dr. Laura Maggie, for setting up a stage, uh, you know, for me to talk about what we're going to do at the ISHIP World Congress. Uh, let me tell you, it is like a dream come true for all of us to be hosting this ISHIP World Congress at Bengaluru. Uh, this is going to happen between the 24th to 27th of September this year. But more than anything else, we want to make it really special, not just for researchers and collaborators and academicians. We want to really get our support groups on. I do, I'm not really sure whether we can get an advocacy group on, but definitely we have self groups which are quite prevalent in our country, but they're not together. They don't have leadership as yet. So this is something that is motivating us. I wouldn't, definitely I would want the patients to do it together, but there is some little bit of initiation which has to come from the providers. And that's what we want to set up at the ISHIP World Congress. So a conference is just, it is incomplete if I'm saying it's only for doctors or healthcare for personnel. It is going to be complete only when the community is going to be involved when the legislators are going to understand what are the problems, how can they help us socioeconomically to come out of this? Because this is a crisis that's happening in the community and not just in you know, a medical textbook or a journal, it's happening in our society. So that's what we want to do. And I would be really happy to host all of you, maybe some recorded uh, you know, information, which I could probably, I, 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 we had actually extended an invite to Lainey, but if that is not possible, at least I would want some snippets of you know, information from all of you, which would serve as a starting momentum for us to set up this group. Uh, I'm just coming out of a promise talk, which we did yesterday. It was not a walk, it was a talk because it was so easy for us to Zoom all over India. India is a big country. So it is very, very difficult to get all people to walk in every place. So what we did was we Zoomed out and we got, believe me, we had representations from North, South, East, West of our country. We had so many patients and survivors talk in their own languages to try to help uh, you know, to show their solidarity. This was a prelude that we wanted to tell them, yes, there's going to be a support group that we want to organize, you know, launch at the ISHIP World Congress. And we had everyone tell us that they're going to be there and help us maybe even set up a WhatsApp group with, a, with leadership, with a doctor or a healthcare personnel to guide them the right way. So this is, you know, yesterday's promise talk. And what I want to tell is, we don't want to be do, reinventing the wheel. There's a lot of material that is available. We want to really make use of the resources that you all have, which you've really worked hard for so many years, convert it into different languages because yes, that is a very important thing. You know, uh, even pictorial representations matter. It cannot be always, uh, you, uh, you know, prints of uh, material because many people cannot read. There are different kinds of people. Uh, you know, the south of India is different from the north of India. The west of India is different from the east of India. We have different kinds of people, urban versus rural, the most educated and not educated. So we want to put them all together and say we are there. And preeclampsia actually is the third largest killer of pregnant mothers and their babies in our country. And there's a lot going on about postpartum hemorrhage, infections and anemia in our country, but preeclampsia is a sinister killer, which is there behind every case that's killing moms. And definitely as providers, we find that a guideline cannot, or anything, a policy, whatever, cannot be implemented unless the patients say this is possible, they are able to understand, they are able to come for treatment and make a difference. And once a survivor has come out, and has had a positive result, it would be much easier as providers, at least in you know, the kind of stage that I'm in in my country, to build the confidence in others to say, yes, this is a real example of someone who came to antenatal visits regularly, who did the screening, who, who took aspirin, who made sure she was on calcium and came out of it without criticality. And NICU is a big burden too. So, you know, it's 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 so 
it's it's so difficult for some patients to understand that you know we're taking the baby out very early it could mean a lot of money it could mean a lot of time that is spent but once they realize that we're doing it for a reason because we don't want this baby to die but to survive in the nicu in a healthy way from another survivor believe me it will make a difference so there's so much that's actually running in my mind i've just put in some points which i want to cover uh, as uh, as far as the society goes, the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine India, we started off in 2017. 2021 is where we launched the PENI project or the Preeclampsia Education of the Nation India, that is to certify obstetricians and gynecologists for preeclampsia in collaboration with the ISHIF. We moved on next year and said it's not just obstetrician and gynecologists, it's all providers, the physicians, the anesthesiologists, the radiologists. So we had the VLSPE program or the virtual learning series on preeclampsia, which is again an online program, which we started last year and both were launched on the World Preeclampsia Day. Moving ahead, the thought process, we were so wanting to have the support groups and this is what we did last year. So I'm, you know, there's a lot of, progress, a lot of unity, what should I say, between everyone in the community that we want to do our best to fight preeclampsia, not just as a country, as a world community. Yes, Thank and I so think much, with all that you said, you know, it, we are so connected through mobile Absolutely. technology, through internet technology, that we are don't have to be isolated in the process of forming patient advocacy groups or teaching women how to advocate for themselves or even um, simple things like education about why your blood pressure is being taken at every appointment. All of those things are things that we can share among us as organizations and um, as you say, like not reinvent the wheel. Um, so that actually is a great segue to um, one of our colleagues from APEC Ghana. Koiwai uh, Koilarba Ofosuapea. Um, and I would like her to come on and just tell us a little bit about what brought her to advocating for preeclampsia education in Ghana and some of the inspiration that she had um, from other advocacy organizations that were already working in this space. Koiwa, are you with us? I know sometimes it can be difficult, um, depending on where we are in the world, to get technology functioning. I'm gonna Koiwa, if you want to just jump in when whenever that's we can't hear you right now. <laughs> but um, so um, we have about 15 minutes left in our chat today. And so I'm going to sort of open it up to the group um, to answer one last question. And then I encourage all of you who are on the call with us to please put your um, questions for any of our panelists in, into the chat. And um, as well as um, if you are a preeclampsia survivor to share your story and, and tell us a little bit about what brought you here today. But I'm gonna let everyone um, jump in on the last question, which is to say, if we could do one thing to move the bar on improving outcomes for patients with preeclampsia in your country or in globally, um, what would it be? And I see Laura McGee's got her hand up, so I'll, I'll call on her first, but um, to our other panelists, please feel free to let me know. <laughs> thank, thank you, Lainey. Sorry, I'm a, I'm a keener. Um, and I, um, I am only able to join you for the first 45 minutes. So with my apologies, I will, um, have to drop off after making the comment. I um, there are two priorities, and I can't decide, so I'll just give you give you both from from my perspective. Is one um, I think we need to give some oxygen, spend some time um, focusing on antihypertensive therapy. That's probably the, the the answer that people would expect me to give. Um, but I also think that we need to spend time on term preeclampsia spent a lot of time talking about preterm and about aspirin, um, but the, the more than half of the maternal complications and a significant proportion of baby complications occur at term. And um, 
uh, with 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 the you know the same mental health and 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 other implications. So that would be my wish uh, if Santa's granting this year. And I wish um, all of you a very happy preeclampsia day. And thank you so much. For, yes, thank um, you for being with us, Dr. Okay. McGee, and for your continued advocacy and research in this space. You've done so much. Um, I'll next call on um, Ashley Mutetti. Um, what would you like to see move the bar? Um, we have seen, um, personally, I would like to see ultrasound being free for every woman attending antenatal clinics. Uh, we've seen uh, it helps in early detection um, of preeclampsia. Majority of the women um, go into hospitals when it's too late and nothing can be done. And they only had one opportunity to do a scan uh, and an ultrasound and nothing can be done at that time when it's too late. However, if we can be able to have, and in fact, that is what we are working towards in advocating for ultrasound services to be free in Kenya, to deliver is free. You can go to hospital and deliver for free. But during this period of antenatal care, that's where the challenge is. And we are really advocating for having um, ultrasound and scans to be done for women for free. And this way we'll be able to detect anything that is happening with the baby and know how to mitigate the issue. Thank you. Yeah, I think you bring up a great point, Ashley, which is that sometimes the first sign that something is going wrong in preeclampsia is that the baby is me measuring small for gestational age. And something as simple as an ultrasound could help diagnose a woman and, and have her at least being watched more closely, watching her blood pressure, looking at those lab values, all the things that we know that, that sort of go along with a good care pathway, as opposed to a woman, you know, presenting and, and experiencing a stillbirth or a placental abruption or various things that are happening down the line because of preeclampsia. And um, uh, Eleni mentioned in the chat, you know, self-monitoring or community monitoring of blood pressure is also so critical to making sure that women are aware and that um, they're getting to care in time. Um, Marcus, I think you had your hand up next. <laughs> That's very kind of you, Lenny. I think there's, there's three things. We're, we're here as, as a global audience. Uh, and so we've got to recognize that um, the care that's available in uh, Western Europe and in the in the States and North America is going to be very different from uh, in other parts of the world. So there's three A's I would like to see. First of all, awareness, knowing those signs and symptoms, knowing what they are. Second thing is asking questions. Well, women and pregnant people have to be uh, feel free to ask questions of their medical professionals. Ask why something is happening. Ask what can be done differently. Ask if there's anything they are concerned about. And the final thing and it comes on from this is advocacy. Partners, you need to be involved. You can spot the signs and symptoms as well and raise the alarm bell when it's needed. Those three things together, I think, uh, are a simple global solution which will help reduce the burden. So that's where I'm coming from. Thank you, Selene. I love it, the three A's. And um, I think that second one is one of the, the pieces that is most critical in, in helping patients to, and their partners to understand that it's okay to question what's happening and, and to ask questions and not just assume that um, you don't know, you know less because you are the patient in the room. That's really great. Um, Dr. Rajan. Yes. Um, yes, I would say education, empowerment, collaboration, comprehensive healthcare, and of course, integrated with the community. And there is where I want the survivors and the patients to come together to make it so meaningful. So we are looking forward to put all these concepts in the World Congress. So I invite you on behalf of each and every ISHIP member to be a part of the World Congress which is going to happen in Bengaluru, maybe some way, uh, you know, the, we would probably connect with each other and try to integrate all the research that's going on uh, into the community. That's perfect. Thank you, Dr. Rajan. And I think um, all of us advocacy organizations are constantly talking about the intersection between patients, providers, and researchers. Like, 
we as patients can participate in research through things like the preeclampsia registry, through um, study opportunities like Lynn was talking about, and ways that we can just advocate and, and advance research. And then also um, just including that patient voice in conferences like the ISSHP World Congress, where um, we're really re helping the researchers to kind of remember that at the end of the day, what they are doing actually benefits real lives and real people. So on that note, um, Leah Baker from uh, Preeclampsia Foundation Canada. Thank you, Lainey. Um, yeah, I think empowering women, uh, just like Dr. Ravathi said, um, so getting the education into the women and their family and their supporters so that they can be their best advocates is really, really important. Um, but that also goes back to the healthcare providers. We do need to get more information to these healthcare providers who can provide that education then to the women and their families and their supporters. Um, so they know the signs and symptoms to look out for. Um, so that's one. And then I also think that we need to um, do better with developing, um, uh, and I believe there's technologies coming out um, for, uh, um, sorry, excuse me, um, for pinpointing the women who are at higher risk. So I believe there is something in the U.S. that just came out that was FDA approved recently. And I know there's a really exciting uh, research happening in Canada out in out in the West um, on this topic to to determine which women are at a greater risk, because just think about what would their care, what would that treatment plan look like for those women if we could screen them and know that they're at a higher risk and monitor monitor them closely? I think we would have much better outcomes for these women and and their babies. That's so true, Leah. And I, um, one of the things that often frustrates me when someone comes to the foundation and they've experienced, for example, like the loss of a baby in their first pregnancy or they had a total catastrophic experience because of help syndrome or something like that, is that you know that there are preventions that we could have put in place along the way if that patient had been detected, had been listened to, had, you know, um, that might have prevented those adverse outcomes. Of course, there's still always the chance that there is nothing that we can do, but research has shown there are things that we can do. Um, and research findings like um, this new FDA approved um, diagnostic test to help people within the hospital to better understand, is this patient going to go on to develop sudden severe preeclampsia or will it be okay to monitor at home? Also have implications to the sort of um, societal factors or the personal factors of a patient, you know, whether she truly needs to stay in a hospital or whether she could potentially be monitored from home and really um, improving that patient provider partnership, all the things that you talked about. Um, Dr. Faroz and some of our other speakers, anything else you would like to add as we sort of wrap up and Yes, I would love to. Um, just piggybacking on what Leah said about prediction and prevention, I wanted to see more research on the prevention aspect. You know, we all know about aspirin and calcium, but there's more and more work coming out on nutrition, on diet and physical activity and sleep disordered breathing. I think one way women can feel empowered is if there are things that they can do that they don't necessarily have to wait for their providers to tell them or a test. Um, and I know my patients love it when I talk to them about, for example, the Mediterranean diet or a certain amount of physical activity that can be quite preventative for preeclampsia. So I'd love to see more work and more education around that. And I would just echo the patient voice to say that patients also want all of those things um, because we know aspirin doesn't work for every patient. Um, it does help, but um, right now we're sort of playing a little bit of a guessing game with, with the prevention and for us to have better ways of just saying, these are your risk factors. This is what you need to know. This is what we're going to do to try to prevent it um, would just be such a benefit to the whole process and, and, possibly make all of our organizations go out of business because that's the end goal for all of us, I think, is that um, preeclampsia is no longer harming patients and their babies and their families. Hi, Lenny. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Sorry, network issues, but yeah. <laughs> yes. 
So I'd love for you, this will be a perfect um, sort of end point to just talk about the work that you're doing in Ghana and the wonderful things you're doing, uh, particularly with the patient provider partnership. I, I'm just in admiration with, with all that you guys have done in Ghana. Okay, thank you so much. So um, uh, I'm Koiwa and I'm a full time survivor of preeclampsia. I've had all the spectrums. Uh, my first experience was with eclampsia, then it, the second one was severe preeclampsia. My final one was HELP syndrome. And um, I actually started this patient organization after my second experience. I was like many of the other speakers online trying to find a support group, somebody to speak to, and I couldn't find any. So I expanded my research beyond Ghana. And then I came across um, Australia Action on Preeclampsia, and then they linked me to Preeclampsia Foundation and APEC UK. And so that's how come APEC Ghana came about. And we sort of uh, decided to liaise more with APEC UK because we could you know, we could relate to the English system being uh, previous colonial masters along other things. So I've worked a lot with Marcus Green and um, one of our main aims really have been, uh, you know, like all of us patients advocacy, uh, trying to educate the woman. Uh, the situation with Ghana or maybe some part in Africa is the fact that our women sometimes refuse or do not accept the diagnosis when they are told because it's either associated you know with the superstition or they just don't um, because they did not show any symptom or many other factors they refuse to accept the diagnosis when they are told that they are going through this condition. You also find a situation where there's a conflict between uh, the medical practitioner and religious leaders because uh, as a woman in Africa, Africans, we are religious, at least in Ghana, uh, hate it or like it, that's who we are. So our support system, other than our partner, uh, uh, the religious leader is also part of that support system. So you have most of our women listening to religious, sort of seeking medical advice from religious leaders when they should be seeking medical advice from, from clinicians. And so there are all these barriers that also tend to sort of um, uh, lead to adverse outcome, especially when there ought to be interventions among other things. So APEC work in such a way that we, in Ghana, we have about 16 regions. So we have 10 regional reps out of the 16 regions and they carry out community engagement and endeavors at the grassroots level. In our context, when you have the support and the backing of the traditional and opinion leaders, it makes your work simple when it comes to knowledge dissemination and engaging the patients and women and empowering them because every woman has the voice that sort of influences them. It's every woman has the voice that they listen to. It's, it's not necessarily the one they lie in the bed with, but every woman has that voice that they'll be like, oh, okay, he said that. Okay, I need to pay more attention to that. Oh, okay, I need to ask more questions. And one of the things that in our patients' advocacy engagements, even with stakeholders, is the issue of risk communication. We have a situation where most of our health practitioners practitioners have issue with communicating, you know, uh, what those BP reading means. What does that mean for the woman? What is the possible outcomes among other things? I mean, in my first experience, I never, nobody said anything, even though I was showing all the symptoms and, and, and research being carried out is showing uh, issues of uh, how much information is too much to give to a woman and how much information is too little to give to a woman who has this condition. And so that has been some of the problem, trying to engage the health practitioners and nurses and midwives in our context to know how to communicate this risk. And that will basically be influenced by the kind of patient that they are dealing with. And so it's very necessary that health practitioners know the patient that they are dealing with among other things. We also partner with the ANC clinics at the various public hospitals to sort of have that peer uh, sharing of storage during ANC because most of the women really relate well when they can hear the story from themselves from a woman who has been through it when they can see it and they can be like, oh, okay, she's saying it. She's been through it. She survived it. Let me listen to her. Rather than it's just being a nurse or a doctor, uh, a midwife who at that moment has a cup of, of a clinician and they're like, ah, oh, you're just a clinician. You're just talking too much. Like, you know, how can you really relate to this? And so those are some of the ways that we go about it. And we also work a lot with the regulators that the Ghana Health Service and Ministry of Health, because in, for any intervention to be successful at our level, you have to have their endorsements and their involvement in it at the, at the, at the clinician and the uh, practitioners level. And so our challenges here, other than religious barriers, is also infrastructure, because not in 
beyond the physical building is the availability of commodities to manage these conditions. My last baby, I lost her because there was not uh, surfactant, which was not in stock at the hospital when she was in NICU. And so um, these are some of the ways that APEC Ghana we engage. We, we really also uh, provide uh, support for survivors. So you have uh, people who call in individually by finding us on Facebook or social media. But then we also st uh, started piloting a group counseling support program with the Greater Accra Regional Hospital to provide group support for women who are going through it or don't go, uh, uh, have survived it, among other things. But one of the key things that we've noticed is that the women who have gone through this are not patronizing that group counseling support. They really, um, they have issues of one, maybe transportation to move to the place to be part of that support group. So you're talking about economic risk factors. They have issues of not wanting to, you know, having issues with getting the approval from their partners, among other things. And so that has actually been a difficult pilot, but we are still on it. And so I guess at the end of the day, when we go around doing our community engagements and endeavors, even in the markets and the local markets, all we keep beating into the, women, uh, the years of our women is that you should know the symptom, spread the word, save a life, know the symptom, spread the word and consult your health professional. Thank you. That's perfect. And I think, um, you know, to the point that Marcus made earlier in the call, um, there are advocates, there are partners, there are um, leaders, policymakers who can have such an influence on how um, <clears throat> how empowered women feel to be able to, um, you know, go and seek out treatment and, and feel comfortable doing that. And um, that's not just something that's confined to countries like Ghana. We experience that here in the U.S. You know, um, there are communities where religious leaders hold a lot of sway, you know, partners, aunties, grandmothers, people who are sort of surrounding the patient to whom she she listens. And so um, that really kind of draws our global chat to a close. Thank you for all of our panelists, um, for all the good work you do and for taking time out of your day from literally dozens of time zones. Um, as a reminder, the rest of today is World Preeclampsia Day. And you can go grab some graphics and help to spread the word on your social channels by visiting preeclampsia.org slash awareness month. And please do check out these wonderful partners who are doing great work out um, in the community. Whether there's two hours left in your, your uh, May 22nd or you're just beginning your day, um, please take this opportunity to just join your voices, share your stories and help as, uh, as Koiwa said, um, share awareness and save a life. Thank you all so much for being here.